You know, as the president turns up the heat on the campaign for gun control, it seems that gun rights advocates are upping the ante on recruiting their target children. Joining me now, Democratic Congresswoman Jack Beer of California, who was just appointed to a new Congressional Gun Violence Prevention Task Force, as well as Dan Gross, president of the Brady Campaign to Prevent Gun Violence. It's good to have you both here, and I want to start out with this New York Times report that it found that some gun groups were seeking to, quote, introduce children to high-powered rifles and handguns while invoking the same rationale of those older, more traditional programs, that firearms can teach life skills like responsibility, ethics, and citizenship. I want to get both of your reactions. Congressman, I'll start with you. What's your reaction to this? I, I think it's ironic that on the one hand they are doing research on how to attract uh, children to guns and yet want to prevent and have been successful uh, in preventing uh, the Congress and the CDC from researching gun violence prevention. So uh, it reminds me a lot of the Joe Camel commercials and the efforts to try and encourage kids to smoke. With the logic being, Dan, that the Second Amendment is not going anywhere and the right to bear arms exists, playing devil's advocate here, doesn't it make sense to try to educate our youth about the responsibility of using a firearm, the dangers of using a firearm? Yeah, I mean, in, in a true way to educate young people about both the responsibility and the true dangers, um, that's not a bad thing. What is a bad thing is blatantly mar marketing these guns to young people. Basically, it exposes the true colors of the gun lobby. You know, they're not concerned, and the gun industry, they're not concerned about the prevention of gun violence. They're just concerned about selling more guns. You know, the rest of the American public wants to engage in a meaningful conversation about exactly what you're, you're saying. What we can do, respectful of the Second Amendment right to own guns, respectful of the fact that hunting and target shooting and protection are deeply ingrained notions in, you know, in, in a lot of our, our country, but have that conversation simultaneous to the risks associated with having guns in the home and what we can do to prevent tragedies. Sure, the tragedy that is most uh, fresh on everyone's mind, Newtown. Uh, right, there's a hearing underway in Connecticut uh, about stopping gun violence, and some of the victims' families are testifying. Take a listen. I'm never going to have my son back. I accept, accepted what happened that day when it happened. I didn't like it. I couldn't change it. He wouldn't want me to sit around crying or feeling bad. I'm out trying to do something to help them and to, to help the other victims. Neil's son was Jesse Lewis there. And this is a live image of the testimony that continues there. One thing also that I want to pass along is the fact that New York City Police Commissioner Ray Kelly appeared on the Sunday talk shows yesterday. He was asked about the assault weapons ban, and this is his answer saying that they're not the big problem. Take a listen. For us in New York City and I believe in most urban centers throughout America. The problem really is concealable handguns. Only 2% of the people that we've arrested for guns in the last uh, two years have had uh, assault weapons. So Congresswoman, a lot of Republicans have jumped on that, uh, being that they're coming after our guns. Obviously, Ray Kelly deals with a different type of situation in an urban city center as opposed to someone who lives in rural America. What do you think about his response? Well, I think he's accurate, and it's very important that we do everything in our power to make sure that people have guns, keep them safe, and, and use them appropriately. Uh, I just had a gun buyback in San Mateo County last weekend. We, we collected, voluntary buyback, we collected 680 guns. Uh, half of them were handguns. Uh, 24 of them were assault weapons. One was a street sweeper. One was a, a sawed-off shotgun with the serial numbers having been erased. So uh, there are guns that should not be in, our, in circulation, and we should do everything in our power to get them out of circulation. We're seeing video of that gun buyback, and it really is amazing as you, as you point the type of weapons that are that are floating out there, certainly the kind that are most scary with the serial numbers uh, that are scratched off. But that's the reality in certain cities, certain places around the country. Dan, in an interview with the New Republic, President Obama said he understood where gun owners are coming from, saying that if you grew up and your dad gave you a hunting rifle when you were 10, and you went out and you spent the day with him and your uncles, and that became part of your family's traditions, you can see why you'd be pretty protected of that. Uh, it's trying to bridge those gaps, and I think that is going to be the part of the biggest task over the next several months. He went on to add that he does skeet shoot uh, while at Camp David. So what is it that's so frightening uh, to those people out there that support guns uh, and gun ownership that think that 
taking assault weapons and these military style weapons is infringing from their rights. Right. I mean, you know, it's basically people buying into the party line of the gun lobby. The reality is, when you look at sensible gun control measures, take assault weapons ban, for example, the overwhelming majority, not only of the American public, not only of gun owners, but of NRA members are in favor of those measures. Those measures have nothing to do with taking away the Second Amendment right to bear arms. So, you know, what, what's happening is the conversation that's being projected out into popular culture is really just a conversation on the extremes. The overwhelming majority of the American public supports these solutions. The only place where it's really an evenly split partisan political debate is in the halls of Congress, and that's what we need to change. You know, the president at every turn has underscored his administration's deep belief and respect for the Second Amendment and for gun owners, and the interview that you were just quoting is another, yet another example of it. You know, we just need to you know, educate the American public and inspire the American public to make their voice heard on the issue, because as the president said, when he announced the, his administration's recommendations from the task force, you know, the only way we're going to create change is if the American public demands it. And that's, that, it's up to us now. Congresswoman, as Dan points out, it really is going to fall on your lap and everyone else's lap on the Hill to talk about this type of policy change needed in the country. But as we talk about immigration reform and gun control within the same breath and sentence, is there enough uh, uh, appetite? in Washington, D.C. to provide the American people with comprehensive policy reform on both issues. You know, Thomas, it's our job to do the people's work. And we should have the appetite, as you put it, to, to do both these issues because they're both front burner issues. All right, I want to ask you both to stand by because we have some tape playback of the vice president and president from their meeting today. Take a listen. Uh, law enforcement officials all across the country who obviously uh, share our deep concern about uh, issues of gun safety and how we can protect our communities and keep our kids safe. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I appeared along with Joe to present uh, the administration's ideas uh, in terms of steps that we have to take. Uh, and. Uh, I issued a number of executive actions that can, could be taken unilaterally uh, in order to improve uh, our collection of data, to make sure that we're coordinating more effectively with state and local governments, uh, and uh, to do everything that we could to improve uh, the issue of gun safety uh, and to make our communities safer. But as we've indicated before, uh, the only way that we're going to be able to do everything that needs to be done uh, is with the cooperation of Congress. And that means passing uh, serious laws that uh, restrict the access and availability of uh, assault weapons and magazine clips that aren't necessary uh, for uh, hunters and sportsmen and uh, those who are responsible gun owners uh, who are out there. Uh, it means that we are serious about universal background checks. Uh, it means that we take seriously issues of mental health uh, and school safety. Uh, we recognize that this is an issue that uh, elicits a lot of passion uh, all across the country. And uh, Joe and uh, my cabinet members who've been involved in this have been uh, on a listening session over the last several months. Uh, no group is more important uh, for us to listen to than our law enforcement officials. Uh, they're where uh, rubber hits the road. And so I welcome this opportunity to work with them, uh, to hear their views in terms of what would make the biggest difference to prevent uh, something like uh, Newtown or Oak Creek from happening again. Uh, uh, but uh, many of them also recognize that uh, it's not only the high-profile mass shootings that are of concern here, it's also uh, what happens on a day-in, day-out basis. Uh, in places like Chicago or Philadelphia where uh, young people uh, are victims of gun violence every single day. Uh, that's why part of the conversation that we're going to be having today uh, relates not only to uh, the issue of uh, new uh, laws or better enforcement of our gun laws. It also means uh, what are we doing to make sure that we've got the strongest uh, possible law enforcement teams on the ground. Uh, what are we doing to hire more cops? What are we doing to make sure that they're getting uh, the training that they need? What are we doing to make sure that uh, sheriff's offices uh, in uh, rural counties uh, have uh, access to some of the resources that some of the big cities do uh, in order to deal with some of these emergencies? So uh, I'm looking forward to a, uh, a robust conversation. Uh, I know that this is not a shy group. 
mainly because uh, dealing uh, with life and death situations every single day. But I'm very grateful to them for uh, their participation. Uh, this is a representative group. Uh, it comes from uh, a wide cross-section of communities across the country. Uh, and hopefully, uh, if law enforcement officials who are dealing with this stuff every single day uh, can come to some uh, basic consensus in terms of steps that we need to take, Congress is going to be paying attention to them uh, and we'll be able to make progress. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Moments ago, the president's remarks from inside the gun violence meeting that he's holding with the vice president in attendance there, the police chiefs from Aurora, Colorado, Oak Creek, Wisconsin, and Newtown, Connecticut, all sites within the last six months that have had shooting tragedies. Congressman, your reaction to that, saying that it is basically put on you the cooperation of Congress to see something get done beyond executive orders from the president? It is our job, and the president has put forth common sense uh, proposals, uh, universal background checks requiring every state to uh, offer their crime data is going to be very important in this effort. Assault weapon ban, high capacity magazines, you know, holding a hundred round high capacity magazine in my hand on Saturday was uh, unnerving. There's no no place for that kind of an instrumentality in our civil society. Dan, real quickly, do you think 2013 is the year to get this done? I do. The White House is committed to it, the American public is behind it, and we just need to make that voice heard. And if we do, then Congress will do the right thing. Dan Gross, Brady Campaign, Congresswoman Jackie Spirit. Thank you both. We're back with much more after this.